Greetings and welcome. My name is Michael Le Chevalier and I'm acting executive director of the Lumen Christi Institute. Lumen Christi was founded in 1997 by Catholic scholars at the University of Chicago. And our mission is to make the Catholic intellectual tradition in its depths and breadths, a living dialogue partner at the University of Chicago and in our broader society through courses, lectures, summer seminars, and virtual events like these. Uh, I wanna call your attention to two exciting upcoming events that we are hosting. This coming Tuesday at 7 p.m. Central, we're going to be hosting Roberto Goitsueda from Boston College and Naomi De Anda from the University of Dayton for a special event that's part of our um, ongoing series on Hispanic theology that will be on Latino Christology, um, really looking at Christ as the accompanier. Um, and it's, it's going to be a very exciting event, um, uh, especially, you know, Professor Roberto Goitsueda um, really helped um, lay out important marks within this field. So a real opportunity um, to explore some of the diversity of the Catholic intellectual tradition. Um, also in a week and a half on Thursday, May 27th, at the same time, 7 p.m. Central, we'll be hosting an event on Catholic thinker, Rene Girard, conversion and the present media moment. Um, it'll help us to untangle a bit uh, the more dangerous dynamics of social media and to think about what it might mean for the gospel and indeed for Christian discipleship to take place through that medium. Uh, we'll be having scholars Carly Osborne, Grant Kaplan, and uh, the CEO of Word on Fire, Father Steve Grunau, um, in conversation moderated by a biographer of Rene Girard, Cynthia Haven. Uh, once more, you can find a link for that within the chat or at our website. Um, today's event is co-presented with the Bolandist and co-sponsored by America Media. For more than four centuries, the Bolandists have worked earnestly to find and preserve the stories of our saints. And if not for their labor intensive search through archives and libraries the world over, thousands of documents about the saints and their time would have been lost. Now, once saved from destruction and oblivion, they have been evaluated according to the most rigorous historical critical criteria. And now the Bolandists are working to turn their facilities into a 21st century library by launching new research programs, digitizing the collections and creating the databases necessary for their work. This will help to preserve the testimony of their saints, their example and inspiration. Uh, we're lucky today to be having an actual Bolandist with us, one of the researchers, um, and who will be able to unpack a little more uh, the history and work of the Bolandists themselves. But you don't have to wait. You can support the Bolandists even now before the presentation begins. Um, with by following the link that's posted within the chat. You can also support our efforts to make available programs like these for free to audiences like you by donating today at www.lumenchristi.org slash donate. Throughout this pandemic year, we've hosted over 70 um, online webinars like these and have had over 200,000 people engaging within our content from all 50 states and indeed um, across the globe in over 68 different countries. Now, at the end of the presentation, there'll be an opportunity for audience Q&A. You can pose a question at any time using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We'll also be inviting select people who pose questions using the Q&A to be reading their questions aloud, um, giving voice to them. Unfortunately, not video, but nonetheless voice, an opportunity for you to continue to um, be more engaged within our work. But now it is my pleasure to welcome our moderator. Welcome him back indeed, not only to this virtual stage, but also to uh, Chicago in some respects, Father Michael Garanzini. Um, Father Michael is the president of the Association of Jesuit Colleges and Universities and the secretary for higher education for the Society of Jesus. Now, prior to his current work, um, he, Father Garanzini was also chancellor at Loyola University of Chicago for two years, and before that president for 14 years. So Father Garanzini, welcome back to our virtual Chicago stage, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Michael. It's good to be here. Um, really appreciate uh, Lumen Christi doing this for us and, and uh, working with us on bringing the Bolandists to, uh, to life here. So thanks, thanks for bringing that. We have a special 
uh, guest today, who is, as Michael said, uh, a Bolandist, Father Robert Gutting, and he, uh, I'm going to turn this over to him right away. I don't think he needs a lot of introduction. I think he'll tell us about himself and, and the uh, unusual work that he does as a full-time research scholar. And uh, Father, uh, Father Robert, the floor is yours. Hello, good afternoon from the Bolandist Library in Brussels. Let us start this webinar with a few images, which I would invite you to contemplate in silence. Let us imagine what the church would be today without those exceptional personalities whom we venerate as saints. Probably the church wouldn't exist anymore, or it would be just a mere institution. In the creed, we proclaim that we believe in one holy Catholic church. Holy, because it is the body of Christ, of course, but not only. If the church is holy, it is also because at every generation, some and even many men and women decide to follow Jesus seriously. They make themselves entirely available to the Holy Spirit, and so they are able to bring new responses to responses rooted in the gospel to the challenges of their times, thus transforming their world and bringing it closer to the kingdom of God. So the saints are essential to the life of the church. They are an essential part of the church history. So it is of utmost importance that their lives and cult should be seriously studied and that all the historical sources, as well as the literature regarding them, should be preserved and published by competent scholars. This is precisely the mission of the Bolandist Society a Jesuit research center and library located in Brussels. As we all know, the saints were immensely popular during the late antiquity and the Middle Ages. Among many reasons, one reason in particular was that they were offering the only hope of healing in an age where scientific medicine was almost non-existent. So in order to remember their deeds, virtues and miracles, and so to satisfy the curiosity of the faithful and to promote their cult, their lives were written. First, the passions of the early martyrs, then the lives of the holy hermits, monks, bishops, religious men and women, kings and queens, and even some lay. It's a huge literature amounting to several thousands of texts composed in Greek, in Latin, 
as well as in the languages of the Christian East, Coptic, Syriac, Arabic, Ethiopian, Armenian, Georgian, Slavonic, and later the vernacular languages. Only in Latin, we estimate the amount of texts relating to saints, so lives, uh, collections of miracles, and so on, uh, before, prior to 1500, to more or less 15,000, 15,000 different Latin texts. In the West, those Latin texts were usually copied in huge volumes called legendaries. Each may contain a hundred or more lives of different saints written on parchment, which suppose so for making such a book uh, quite a flock of sheep and the weight of the book would be around the 15 kilos. So these were very costly volumes. Now, all those lives, of course, not all those lives are accurate, trustworthy documents. The writers had often a tendency to exaggerate the saints' virtues and miracles. There was also a kind of emulation between saints. So my saint, about whom I write, should do more and better than the other. Emulation also between the shrines keeping the relics of those saints. Then some and quite a number of passions of martyrs and of lives of saints were written several centuries after the, after the actual life of the saint. So their contents often, their contents offer hardly anything historical. After the invention of printing in 1450, a few attempts were made to publish a significant selection of those texts. The most important one was made by Surius, a Carthusian, a Carthusian monk from Cologne. These are, you can see them, six big volumes in folio, printed between 15, uh, 1570 and 1575. And they present the lives of the saints according to the order of the calendar. Uh, you see, this is the volume of uh, the saints of January, February. <clears throat> Unfortunately, Surius took some regrettable initiatives, so to speak. On one side, he rewrote some lives in better Latin. He thought, this is bad Latin, it doesn't sound well, so let us rewrite them. Then he dropped some passages which he judged useless or maybe ridiculous or scandalous. And so he was exercising in that way a kind of censorship. These initiatives were, of course, disastrous from both a philological and a historical point of view. But those considerations were not yet very alive in the time of Surius. And here comes the Dutch Jesuit Heribert Roswede. In 1607, Heribert Roswede publishes this little book of not even 100 pages, 
Fasti Sanctorum, Quorum Vitae in Belgicis Bibliothecis Manuscripte, which means a list of the saints whose lives are kept in libraries of Belgium as manuscripts. This is a program, a program which Roswell printed in 800 copies by the renowned printer Plantin in Antwerp, and he sent it to bishops, abbots, scholars all over Europe. His plan was to publish Lives of Saints, divided in 18 volumes according to a certain plan, also according to the calendar. But his main preoccupation was to respect the manuscripts, to respect, to respect absolutely the text as he found it in the manuscript tradition. So Rostoid explains that project in this book, and he joins the list, a list of no less than 1300 saints for whom he claims to have already a life in his possession. Actually, Roswell had a kind of strange hobby, we can say. He used to visit the libraries of Belgian monasteries and finding there the legendaries, those collections of lives of saints, he would copy all the texts which he didn't uh, possess yet. And that's how he constituted uh, the bulk of his collection. In 1615, Roswell will publish according to those criteria, those rigorous criteria, he will publish a book under the title Vitae Patrum, it's more than 1,000 pages uh, in folio size, so a very big volume, and it contains all the texts relating to the fathers of the desert, those texts which have both a Greek and a Latin tradition, so Roswell provides a critical edition of the Latin tradition based on several, on quite a number of manuscripts and of incunable editions. Unfortunately, Roswell will die in 1629 without having published even the first volume of his planned collection. He leaves behind a huge documentation, all those hundreds of copies of Lives of Saints, which must have been piling up in his room. So quite happily, the superior of his house in Antwerp was an intelligent man, and before throwing everything away, he asked for some advice. Can we do something with this documentation? And the man whom he asked for advice was no other than Jean Bolland. Jean Bolland was a Jesuit from the region of Liège in Belgium. And he answered the superior, yes, of course, this is a very important documentation. We should do something about that. We should try to, to realize Roswell's project. So no other than Bolan was more qualified to launch that project. And he was appointed by the provincial just to do it. Then Bolland was not entirely happy with Roswell's project. So he decided to enlarge it. 
quite considerably. Roswell had decided to publish only texts of lives of saints. But, says Bolland, there are many saints for whom we have no life, but we know their names from ancient calendars and martyrologies or from church historians like Eusebius of Caesarea. So those saints, even if they have no life, they should not be absent from our work. This added quite a lot, of course. Then for some saints, on the contrary, we have many lives because those saints were popular and at every generation, it was thought necessary to write a new life, a life which corresponded more with the, with the style, with the expectation of the times. And so Bolland says, when there are many lives, when there are several lives, we shall publish all the lives. So the entire documentation, not only one life. Then, for every saint, it would be useful to add some biographical data, at least, not just publish a text, but add some data about uh, who he was and the necessary notes also of explanation uh, in the text editions. So, with that in mind, Bolland starts working, but the project has grown so immensely that he risked to be drowned. Therefore, Bolland asked for a collaborator, and that's how Gottfried Henskens, a known under his Latinized name, Henschenius, who was coming from the Dutch Limburg region. So he comes to help Bolan in his project. And then Bolan entrusts him some saints to be treated. And Henschenius works. And when he comes back to Bolan with his homework completed, Bolland is very surprised because the disciple did better than the master. Actually, Henschenius did not only provide some elementary data about each saint, but he made a thorough historical study of every saint studying every possible question about uh, what were all the sources about him, what was their trustworthiness, what could we know exactly uh, about that saint, what about his cult, where uh, was that cult diffused, in which places, and so on. So Bolland realizes that that is really the model to be followed. And so the project is modified again. For each saint, a complete dossier will be provided. A dossier which will basically, for most saints, uh, include two parts. The first part, called Commentarius Previus, will be a historical introduction, studying all those questions which we have seen Henschenius had so egregiously studied. And then the second part will be the critical edition of all the lives, all the collections of miracles huh, relating to 
the saint in question. Well, our two Jesuits so start working and in 1643, the first two volumes of the Acta Sanctorum, the Acts of the Saints, containing all the saints feasted in during the month of January, those two volumes are published. The number of saints included is 1170, and the volumes count more than, together, more than 2,000 pages in folio. Each volume is completed by no less than six indexes. Two indexes of the saints treated in the volume, alphabetical and chronological. Then four indexes about the matter contained in the volume, that is an index of names of persons, of names of places, of rare Latin words which occur in the lives of the saints, and then a complete index of all the topics which we find in the lives of the saints published in those volumes. Like, for example, you will see uh, an entry, uh, Caicos, that is blind. And so all the episodes where it is question of some blind people who are healed or who happen to, to be uh, in, uh, in some saint's life. Let's have a look at the frontispiece of these volumes. They have a title, a long title, as was the fashion at that moment. Acta Sanctorum, I read the first, the beginning, Acta Sanctorum, quod quod toto orbe colunto. So there is here a pretense, a claim of exhaustivity. We want to treat the acts of all those saints who are venerated throughout the world. Or even those, as it is said, uh, who are uh, mentioned in historical works. And then there is, you see, the name of John Bolland and the mention Servata Primigenia Scriptorum Frasi. So this seemed so important that it is written in the title. This is Roswell's preoccupation. So we should keep uh, the original text of the writers as it can be found in the manuscript. Now, let us look at the image of this frontispiece. For the work which claimed to be the most important ever published about the saints, we are a little surprised because we cannot see easily any saint here. We would have expected something like this, which is the frontispiece of the third edition of Surius, a celestial court that would be more classical. But here we have an allegorical image. And I can tell you, the saints are present, but they are hidden. Look at the middle of the, at the center of the image. Behind the title, there is a cave and inside the cave, you find the saints, the bodies of the saints. They lie in the darkness and they hold 
the volumes, the manuscript volumes containing their lives. Unfortunately, the cave is in the darkness. Happily, the first allegorical figure, Veritas, the truth, illuminates the cave. And so those little angels with their uh, light can enter the cave and retrieve the precious manuscripts. But they must hurry. There is an enemy. It is in Greek, chronos, the time, and the time eats the documents of the past. So once retrieved, the documents are given to this second allegorical figure, who is called eruditio, erudition. She is the most, maybe one of the most powerful figures in the 17th century. There are many works of erudition at that time. And you see that erudition knows everything. She just has a look at the manuscript presented to her, and she resolves all problems, geographical, chronological, historical. Erudition knows everything. Now, the text can be brought to this figure, which is enthroned on top of the cave, and she has no name, but we could call her critical hagiography. She is the one composing the big volumes of the Acta Sanctorum. She not only, she doesn't write edifying lives, but she collects the existing lives and she publishes them and she studies them, she analyzes them critically. You see what is really extraordinary in this image is that Bolland did not represent the saints, he represented his method, which means that he was very much aware of the originality, the new character of what he was doing. So after the publication of those two volumes of January, the series will go on and it will even accelerate a little bit. So February will count three volumes and will be published in 1658. Then March will come three volumes in 1668. April, three volumes, 1675. And comes the month of May with seven volumes published between 1680 and 1688. How come we jump from three to seven volumes? Well, with the time, in a way, it's quite normal that um, the Bollandists will know more and more and their critical, their historical introductions will increase in size but they will also progressively come to know more ancient texts. And this by essentially by two different means. One was correspondence. We, should, we, we must imagine uh, nowadays it's maybe um, not so easy, but 
the Bolandists were in contact. Although there was no internet at that time, but the correspondence was very much alive and they were in contact with scholars all over Europe. So they received letters asking for information. They sent letters asking for information saying, look, we think there must be a life of this saint uh, who is venerated in your place. Please, could you have a look and tell us? And if there is one, send us the copy. So in that way, they will, of course, increase uh, their documentation. Another way will be to travel. And here in 1660, Henshinius, accompanied by a new companion, Daniel van Papenbroek, who was originally from Antwerp itself, and uh, whose Latinized name is known as Pape Brocius. So Henshenius and Pape Brocius leave Antwerp in 1660, in July, and start a long trip across Germany, Italy, and France. They start with Germany, they go down, huh? and they arrive in Rome, which is the main destination of their travel, at the Vigil of Christmas, 1660. In every city mentioned on the map, they will visit the libraries, in monasteries, in cathedrals, and uh, ask if there are any collections of lives of saints, and then take some notes and eventually ask for some copies to be done and to be sent to Antwerp. In Rome, they will stay nine months copying manuscripts in the Vatican Library and in other important libraries. They will even go to Monte Cassino, to Naples, and then up again to uh, Florence, um, Turin, Milan, and then France. Again, some important destinations, La Grande Chartreuse, uh, Cluny, Citeaux, Dijon, Paris. A travel which will have taken two and a half years. This is the first known expedition whose aim was exclusively to collect ancient documents. Actually, our uh, friends and Shenius and uh, Papa Brocius brought back something like 1,000 new texts texts of lives of saints, which they didn't know, and so which they brought back to Antwerp. Uh, together with lots of books, of course, which they had uh, received uh, from scholars all along their travels. So this was, of course, a very important moment, and it explains the increase huh? in the number of volumes needed to publish the documentation relating to the saints of the month of May and then of all the following months. Another change which will occur is the introduction of illustrations in the volumes of Acta Sanctorum. We find some almost a thousand uh, illustrations and engravings in the volumes starting in the month of April. Those can be um, facsimiles of documents like this one, reproduction of 
objects relating to saints, like this reliquary of Saint Vincent of Soigny, the only image, the only image known of this reliquary, which was destroyed uh, some time later. So quite an important documentation. Or another example, this triumphal arch, which was erected in the Cathedral of Sevilla for the canonization of King Ferdinand III. So an ephemerous monument, but of, we keep trace of it, we keep a memory of it through this engraving. These were made with the means of copper plates and the present Bollandis library still keeps uh, some hundreds of copper plates which were used for the printing of the Acta Sanctorum. In 1695, the first volume of June is published and, surprise, the frontispiece has changed. You remember the first frontispiece, which was kind of very balanced, very humanist also. There were few uh, religious images. Here, we have the impression of something much more Catholic, much more dramatic also. We, we have an impression of instability uh, looking at this image. Actually, what happened in 1695 is that the Bollandists, the Acta Sanctorum more precisely, had been condemned by the Spanish Inquisition. That condemnation had been obtained by the Carmelites, the Carmelite order. They had been really furious that the Acta Sanctorum had denied to Prophet Elijah the title of founder of their order. Now, let us just think for a moment. The Carmelite order was historically founded in the 12th century. So they might have found their spiritual inspiration in Prophet Elijah, but claiming Prophet Elijah as their real founder was a little strange. But so they fought so much that they obtained the condemnation of uh, the Acta Sanctorum. And the decree here is published in four languages. We are in our country, in the Low Countries. So Spanish, the language of the Inquisition, Latin, the language of the church, and then French and Flemish. This was very dangerous for the Acta Sanctorum. They might have been forced to stop. So the Jesuits tried to act in Rome. And finally, happily, in 1715, the condemnation was lifted by Rome. And so the first volume of July which was published that very year, comes back to the first frontispiece. During the whole 18th century, the volumes will be published regularly, one every two or three years, containing the saints, each volume containing the saints of three or four days. So as the contents keep increasing, of course, the progress towards the end slows down. In 1770, 
they had reached the 7th of October. 50 volumes had been published since the first one in 1643. This makes the Acta Sanctorum the largest research project and editorial enterprise of the so-called Ancien Régime, uh, the period which concludes with the French Revolution. Many important texts were published there for the first time. To give you just two examples, the first Life of St. Francis of Assisi by Thomas of Celano had its first edition here in the Acta Sanctorum because the Franciscans were normally forced to know only one life, the life written by Bonaventura later, which gave another, maybe a little revised view of Francis. Another important text which had there its first edition is St. Ignatius of Loyola's autobiography. One may be amazed, but that autobiography had been kept unpublished in the archive of the Jesuit Curia. So it was published for the first time in the Acta Sanctorum. And nowadays, still many texts of lives of saints have still to be consulted in the Acta Sanctorum. Now in 1773, as you know, the Society of Jesus was suppressed by Pope Clement XIV, and the Bollandists had to leave their house in Antwerp. So the library at that time already was partly dismantled. Some very precious pieces took the way to some private collections. This, for example, this famous incunable, illustrated incunable of Pliny uh, is now in Vienna, Austria. The Bollandists were able to continue for a while their work as just as ordinary priests, uh, being guests in the Norbertine Abbey of Tongerlo. But then uh, again, the French invaders arrive in 1795 and they closed, they suppressed all the monasteries. What remained of the library was sold or dispersed very unfortunately, this was one of the most exceptional scientific research libraries of that time. We still keep the catalogue of that library. In 1837, a new beginning. The Jesuits have been restored in 1814 and so in 1837, a new group of Bollandists is established in Brussels in rather precarious conditions under the roof of the old uh, college in the center of the city. Not an easy situation. They had to reconstitute a library from nothing. And then there is no surviving member of the old team so they have to learn everything again from the beginning. Let us just summarize some milestones from that moment. A first milestone is the figure of Father de Smet. You see him here in the middle of that uh, 1895 photo. Father de Smet reorganized the work of the Bollandists uh, according to the new historical and philological method. So, you know, how did the Bollandists manage to publish so many volumes, so many hundreds and thousands of different texts, even if they 
base their editions on manuscripts. But yes, they base their editions on one or two, maximum three manuscripts. But the new method imposes to make a census of all the existing surviving manuscripts for a specific text. And then to classify those manuscripts and to decide about the principles uh, which will be used for the edition. So Father Desmet decides that the Bollandists will go around, will travel again, but this time to make catalogues of hagiographical manuscripts in the big libraries all around Europe. And they will publish those catalogues. So that's a fundamental documentation. They will also realize an index of all the, the hagiographical texts prior to, five, to 1500. So Latin texts, Greek texts, and Oriental texts. These are the so-called uh, Bibliotheca Hagiographica Latina Greca Orientalis. And these remain fundamental uh, instruments for anyone working with lives of saints. Second milestone was the publication, the launch of a journal. Analecta Bolandiana will be the journal of the Bolandists. Um, it is still being published nowadays, twice a year. It is, of course, a much more flexible way of working than those big volumes in folio where you are bound with the order of the, of the calendar. And even if you find a very interesting text about St. Sylvester, well, you will have to wait until the publication of the last volume of December to be able to publish it. And then it will probably not be you who will publish that text. So now the journal offers that possibility, much more flexibility. And in 1905, transfer to a new building, the new Collège Saint-Michel in the suburbs of Brussels with a state-of-the-art library. The first half of the 20th century is dominated by the figure of Father Hippolyte Deloé. Deloé is famous for his critical editions of the most important ancient calendars of the church, Greek and Latin. So that's the so-called Synaxary of Constantinople, the Hieronymian Martyrology and the Roman Martyrology. These are probably the three most important documents for anyone studying ancient hagiography. Then Deloé wrote some fundamental books about the hagiographical method, among which one which I would recommend to everyone here uh, it's translated, of course, in English, The Legends of the Saints. A few words about the Bollandists today, but maybe to complete it, you may be able to ask some questions. Today, the Bollandists are a team of four scholars, two Jesuits, two lay, and a few associate members as well. The Bolandis, it's also a library, a specialized library of some 500,000 volumes, which is constantly updated. Just think that since 1837, the very specialists of the field have been taking care that every significant study, book or article in their discipline should be there. So 
this is really a unique instrument to work about, to work on the saints and on hagiography. The Bolland is today, it's also publications, of course, classical publications like the journal Analecta Bolandiana, as I said, and two series. And here you can see some of our recent titles. We publish books and in the journal articles in the main languages, uh, the main scientific languages, so English, French, German, Italian, and Spanish. But other publications nowadays include databases, and we are very much active now in that sector. Now, whatever the technological changes, we have talked about the change from a manuscript to print. Now we are in the phase of the change between print and digital. But despite all those changes, I can say our mission remains. It remains to collect, critically publish and study the lives and the cult of the saints, all the saints, the saints of East and West. And this is a reason why the work of the Bollandists is also highly appreciated in the Orthodox Church. Our mission remains also to serve, as the frontispiece said, truth and erudition, veritas and eruditio. These two pillars have never been so important as today, when truth becomes sometimes an entirely subjective notion and erudition is threatened by the ignorance and abandonment of our traditions. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Father. Uh, thank you, Father Robert. This was really fascinating, uh, fascinating history. Uh, we love the, the wonderful details uh, of how the Bolandist tradition uh, has started and the, uh, the wonderful scholars that have kept it going through the centuries. It's a, it's a, it's a remarkable project. Uh, before we start to get questions from uh, those who, are, who have been following you, um, let me ask you, uh, how are Bolandists trained today? Are they trained in the regular universities? Where do the Bolandists come from? Then I'm going to ask you how you support your work, because this must be a highly expensive project. So before we get questions about some of the details of your wonderful history, uh, I wanted to make sure we know today who are the Bolandists, where are they trained, and how are you supported? Thank you, Pablo, for this question. So the Bolandists are, uh, beside for the Jesuits, they have their usual uh, training as Jesuits, of course, but normally uh, all the Bolandists are university trained. That is, they uh, study in uh, fields like either ancient and medieval history or um, ancient philology. So the study of ancient languages and this up to the doctorate. I would say, uh, of course, a PhD would be um, a request uh, to be a Bolandist. Then uh, a fundamental um, condition would be the ability to spend many hours uh, inside a library. So to love the company of books. Um, 
I also love really the company of people, of course, and I, I really love teaching, which I do in Rome uh, every other year, teaching hagiography. But yes, you have to, to love the company of books and uh, of, uh, yes. I, I could and, imagine. And to come to, and now, uh, yes, as I mentioned, uh, some Bolandists are lay, and so they just have that university training without maybe the Jesuit formation, which they acquire in the company of the Jesuits <laughs> in some way. Yeah. Good. So so real colleagues, real collaborators. That's yeah. good. And then how are you supported? Who supports you? Huh. That's of course, as you said, uh, this is a, a quite an expensive uh, project, not only maintaining uh, the library, but especially uh, nowadays also paying for the people who work here, huh? because uh, aside from the Bolandis themselves who are scholars and who are paid like uh, university scholars, um, we also have uh, a librarian, we have uh, uh, an accountant, uh, we have, so these are people also whom we have uh, to, to support. So basically, um, the Bolandists have a small uh, fund, which nowadays uh, is, is, is really uh, largely insufficient uh, to support the society. Then we depend directly on two provinces of the Society of Jesus, since this is originally a Belgian work. So nowadays the two Belgian provinces have been uh, integrated in larger provinces. So those two larger provinces uh, support um, the Bolandis uh, uh, in some way. Then um, we also increasingly uh, count on the help and on the support of benefactors to, to support our projects, to help us um, with the library and with all those expenses. Because in Belgium, this, uh, an institution like ours uh, cannot receive public support, unfortunately. I see, yes, thank you. So uh, someone who might be interested in helping with, with both Veritas and Erudicio so, should really be, uh, would find a, a, a good opportunity to, to contribute. Thank you very much. You know, I have a question here from, from Albert Kazell. Uh, he lives in, in Glenbrook, Connecticut, where St. Maurice is the patron saint. Um, and he asks us, uh, why was the erudite uh, Father Del, 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 Del Rey, I think it's Del Rey, uh, so particularly negative about his historicity? Father St. Maurice uh, would certainly fit his categories, uh, name, date, uh, uh, day and date and long cultus uh, around Father uh, St. Maurice. So uh, with three churches in Connecticut alone. So he has an urgent question about his beloved St. Maurice. Uh, do you know much about St. Maurice, Father? Well, I, of course, I visited the Abbey of St. Maurice, which is in, a, in an incredible site, just at the curve of the Rhone River. It's uh, very spectacular. Um, uh, and it's the oldest abbey uh, in, uh, in Western Europe, uh, uh, still in activity. So uh, this is quite, uh, quite, quite remarkable. I think usually we must really, uh, a fundamental uh, thing in studying saints and uh, the historicity of saints and so on is to distinguish between the historical existence of the saints and the trustworthiness of the life, of the written life. Huh? If I take another example, uh, we all know St. George and his dragon. So people will say easily, oh, St. George and his dragon, of course they didn't exist. Well, about the dragon, I wouldn't pronounce uh, myself, but, um, St. George, of course, existed. This is very clear. We have some early 
attestations in old calendars and martyrology. So we know that some churches at a very early time venerated St. George. But what is completely legendary is the life of St. George and the, and the dragon and so on. So we can say, yes, St. George existed, but we don't know anything about his life. And that's the fact for many saints. Yes, there, are, there have been some saints, I guess, that have been removed from the calendar after, uh, certainly after the council, there was one revision of the, of the calendar. Uh, do you anticipate any other changes in the, in the Roman calendar? Well, for the moment. Is, the, uh, is this a dangerous, a dangerous exercise, a dangerous expe uh, uh, speculation? Yeah, as you know, uh, after the reform of Vatican II, the idea was to, to have fewer uh, uh, feasts of saints through the liturgical year. But now, just after uh, two or three pontificates, the calendar has been uh, filled again with many new names, even some who had been removed for some historical reasons, like Catherine of Alexandria, and yes. who was reinserted also for very uh, respectable ecumenical reasons. Yes, yes. It, it would seem to me that, uh, that there are some new saints that have to find their way into the calendar. So there, and then, are, are you discovering anything uh, ston astonishingly new about some saints that we had venerated for many, many years now? Are, are there still new discoveries coming up? Yes, there are still new discoveries. Of course, not as many as in the time of Bolland, who was really um, uh, starting to cultivate a terra ignota almost. But yes, there are still uh, discoveries. Uh, for example, um, a few years ago, an entirely unknown life of St. Francis of Assisi, written by the same Thomas of Chilano, was discovered in a very small manuscript. So some, something which probably was the possession, the private possession of a friar who wanted almost to hide it because yeah. it's in, in a way after the decision imposing the life by Bonaventura, it was not allowed anymore. Yeah. Um, now also, um, it's mostly um, um, in exploring libraries and manuscripts that uh, new texts come to the light and that uh, discoveries can be made. This- Can I ask you? Can I ask you to go back to St. Francis of Assisi? He's a very popular saint. We have a Pope who took his name. And there's, this is a saint which, uh, and part of his popularity is, is connected to some of the legends. For example, his uh, talking to the animals. Uh, so, uh, can you tell us uh, some things about St. Francis that we ought to believe and some things maybe we don't need to believe? <laughs> And it's, you know, St. Francis um, is the, is really the subject of, uh, has been the subject of so many studies recently, it has become almost a specialty inside hagiography itself. But you have to decide, for example, much depends on the faith or on the priority you give to the sources. For example, if you believe um, uh, Bonaventura, uh, you will uh, situate the conversion of Francis of Assisi uh, in the church of St. Damien when he hears Christ talk to him from the cross, which is still preserved uh, uh, nowadays, and Christ tells him, Francis, go and repair my church. And uh, Bonaventura says this was the beginning, the beginning of Francis' call. Huh? 
But when Francis, at the end of his life, writes his testament, he says that he was, first of all, the Lord touched him through the meeting of the lepers. It is when Francis met the lepers in the region of Assisi for the first time that he was touched in his heart. And he writes that in his, uh, in his testament. But this episode maybe was not pleasing everyone. And so, for example, Bonaventura doesn't give it priority like Francis. And Giotto, in the frescoes which he paints in the church, in the upper church of Assisi, Giotto doesn't represent that scene. So, yes, you, there are some interesting things there to be. Yeah, that's, that, that's very interesting. One of the questions, uh, that occurred to me, and I, I'm going to start looking at some questions that are being sent in. But one of the questions that occurred to me was the importance that Antwerp played in in the life of the Bolandist society. Um, it was a strategic place, wasn't it? With commerce all over Europe and perhaps further than much further than Europe. So was that was was Antwerp an important um, factor? in the success of this, uh, this endeavor of collecting materials? Surely the, um, the port, uh, Antwerp as a center of communication did help. But actually, I think that if the Bonadis were settled in Antwerp, it was um, because Antwerp was the main center of the Jesuits in Belgium. It was really uh, the bastion against the, the Protestants. Huh? And so uh, the, the Catholic uh, influence and the presence of the Jesuits in Antwerp was massive. Antwerp was the center of the Counter Reformation in the Low Countries, um, with also in, uh, in the arts, also. Look at uh, Rubens, huh? uh, he was from Antwerp, also. Uh, so, yes, uh, uh, that city was was, uh, it was really uh, the main center of the Jesuit presence. Yes. I'm gonna see if we can uh, get uh, Mr. William North uh, to read his question. It concerns the Eastern church and, and so Eastern saints and that relationship. That too was another very important part of think of your talk was uh, how much the Eastern church appreciates the work of the Bolandists. Can we can we get William North to read his question? Um, can you hear me? Yes, yes. I was wondering if you could say first of all, thank you very much for this talk. It was really wonderful. Um, but could you say more about the Bollandist work on Eastern Christian texts, especially those in Georgian, Armenian, Syriac? I think of Paul Peters' uh, work. And I was wondering, has this incredible linguistic range been possible to maintain among the current Bollandist team? Thank you. Thank you for this question, uh, which is so important in today's church. Huh? The presence, the importance of the, uh, the Christianist huh? in the Christian tradition. So in the Bollandist Acta Sanctorum, the um, the entrance, I can say, if I can say so, of um, the Christian Eastern texts uh, like uh, Syriac or Armenian or others, um, it started quite late. Actually, it started, you, you mentioned the name of Paul Peters. It's, it's exactly him. Huh? And you have the fourth volume of November, which just uh, counts two days, the saints of two days, 9th and 10th of November. When you go through that huge volume, you find for the first time in the Acta Sanctorum, texts in as many languages as, um, so Arabic, Ethiopian, Syriac, uh, Armenian, and Georgian. 
So all the languages are there. And uh, it was all Paul Peter. After him, um, uh, Paul de Vos uh, was uh, competent in Coptic. Um, Michel Van Elbrook, who's, who worked a few years here, and then Hugo Zanetti, who worked here also uh, for some years. Um, they were outstanding scholars in those areas, also because they managed, they were competent in a variety of those languages, uh, which, is, which is amazing. Um, unfortunately for the moment, the, there is no Bolandist for the moment who is specialist in that area. And so this would be, huh, this would be a, a, a wonderful thing if we could, if we could find uh, some, sometimes uh, financing, the possibility of financing a scholar in that area, in one of those languages or in several of those languages. I think it would be, it would be a great thing, especially when you think of the present situation of the church also, it would be quite significant to focus, to put the focus again on the importance of Christianity in both regions in the ancient time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Father Robert. I have a question. This is a, uh, also a question of a very practical nature. <clears throat> and Mr. John uh, Kopchik, as, as perhaps we can get him uh, to read his question as well. Um, this, uh, this asks you about some very practical things that I'm sure you must attend to and be concerned with. Is, uh, is John Kopchik here? Yes, thank you. And thanks for the wonderful presentation. What a collection of valuable, valuable resources. And I'm just wondering about what safeguards are in place to preserve these. I hope something is in place. You mentioned this, you're making it digital, which is great, but just the value of these are unbelievable. Thanks again. Thank you. Uh, yes, it's true. And it's, uh, it's one of our concerns, truly. Uh, how can we better preserve that, uh, that deposit which does not belong to us, but which belongs to the church and to humanity. Um, and so it's true that we have made projects for a better uh, fire detection um, and anti-theft installations. Um, uh, for the moment, um, I can see that we, we could do much more to uh, to preserve materially the library as it is. And so that would surely be an area where um, 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 some help, some support would be most welcome. Um, yes. Aside, of course, from uh, digitizing pieces, uh, which is already something, but which also is, is a huge enterprise and uh, we are still nowhere in, in digitizing even our medieval manuscript uh, collection. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna ask if David Christian would read his uh, very interesting question to you as well. Is David able to be with us? David, um, I'll, can, you, I'll read. can you hear me? Yes, David, is that you? Please, yeah, it is. tell us, give us your question. I think it's very fascinating. Thank you, Father. And, and uh, thank you for all the work you do and um, for taking the time to offer this presentation. I, I'm wondering if there are Bolandists taking trips of the kind you described all over the world to places like Africa, Asia, and the Americas to do the investigatory work um, that you do so well. Huh, that would be the ideal, but um, for the moment we are we are rather uh, and especially in pandemic uh, we have to stay here. But uh, even in other times we are mostly here um, and we work 
uh, in the library, we work to our publication, to the journal, and so on. I'm lucky enough to travel to two places, um, Italy, since I teach in Rome, but still, and Italy is the, the home country of saints. That's where you find the huge, the biggest number of saints. So there is always something to learn and to <laughs> collect in Italy for a hagiographer. But then I also teach in Manila, in the Philippines. And so you were speaking of Asia. So here, yes, we have an Asian country, uh, the, the biggest Catholic country in Asia. And it has up to now two canonized saints, uh, two martyrs who died outside the Philippines. And so meeting those realities is also very interesting to me uh, to, since by formation, I'm more, uh, focused on late antiquity and the Middle Ages, but uh, I developed a real passion for one of those martyrs, who is uh, San Lorenzo Ruiz. Um, and San Lorenzo Ruiz is known to us through the um, through a direct account of. Um, his interrogatory by the Japanese judge, uh, since he was martyred in, uh, in Japan. So we have the text questions and answers uh, copied uh, at that time by the interpreters. So it's a, an extraordinary document, which makes us think of the passions of the early martyrs, of the early Roman martyrs, really fascinating. So you make links like that, uh, which are completely unexpected. That's, yeah, that's fascinating. Um, but when, before we close, I want to ask you a question about the relationship of the Bolandists to the present congregation for the causes of the saints. You must, you must get questions uh, about this all the time. Is there a relationship? I suppose if the, if the, uh, if we had a congregation for the causes of the saints in the last millennia, we would certainly um, not have not need the work of the Bolandists as much as we do. But um, there must be some uh, some things that you think about this congregation in some ways in which you work together. Can can you comment on the the present congregation for causes? Well, uh, we have no. Uh no real institutional relation with the Congregation of Saints. Uh, this because we are mostly an academic research center and uh, we don't want to, uh, to be suspected uh, of being affiliated to the congregation and so to have some interest in pushing this or that. So our, our job is purely uh, of scholarly. But of course, I know the congregation and we send our publications to the congregation and the publication puts aside for us a copy of every positio. So these are the printed documents uh, made for every cause of new bliss or, or new saint. Uh, and so we have here the only almost complete collection of those positions. It's hundreds and hundreds of volumes. Um, and you, you may add some 40 volumes, some 20 volumes every year, 40 volumes every other year, um, which we carry uh, here to Brussels. And so it's, a, it's an incredible documentation. Um, so this, these are the kind of relations uh, we have. Another kind of relation, I mentioned the critical edition commented by Father Deloe of the Roman Martyrology. That was published in 1940. Uh, the Roman Martyrology at that time was full of mistakes of legendary facts and so on. So it was decided to review 
the martyrology on the basis of Father de Lohe's work. So this is another way the Bolandists collaborated in some way, but not directly. Yes, that's, that's, that's interesting. Thank you very, very much for that. You know, as we're, we're approaching, we're going to be approaching Pentecost and uh, one proof of the work of the spirit in our church through the centuries and today is the lives of these saints. Uh, they, they display, if you will, the potential for holiness and the kind of the vast variety of uh, ways that we are instruments of the Holy Spirit. So uh, we have the Bolandists to thank for this. And uh, I, I really appreciate your spending time with us, Father Robert. This has been really an, uh, an exciting uh, uh, afternoon for us here in the States. It's afternoon. So uh, thank you very, very much for this. And I'll turn this over then to, to our hosts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Father. Thank you so thank much you. for your kind hey, hey. attention. Thank you. Um, indeed, on, on behalf of the audience, uh, I just want to thank you, um, Father Robert, for a fantastic presentation um, and really a, 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 a engaging dialogue. And, and I can't wait till we can welcome you here in the States, um, but also back to our virtual audiences um, next year. And also, Father Michael, thank you so much for um, stepping up to the plate uh, and, and really being a fantastic conversation partner here today. Um, but also to you, our audience members, thank you for joining us. Um, this actually concludes uh, this year's series on the saints. Um, you can, on our YouTube page and on our website, uh, find recordings from the whole series um, as we've uh, explored uh, the history of the cult of the saints, as we've looked at relics, um, as we've explored individual lives of the saints. Um, and you can join our mailing list today to stay tuned for next year's program. We will be returning. Um, my gratitude to all of the co-sponsors that we've had throughout this series, um, and including for today, America Media, among those others. Um, but most especially, I'm grateful to the Boland Society. Um, we're just a fledgling 25-year-old organization. We're coming up on 25 years. And to be partnering with a 400-year-old organization, to be making available uh, the rich information uh, about the lives of the saints, um, with audiences all over the world has been an exciting thing that we've been able to do um, during uh, this year of quarantine and pandemic. Um, and one of the silver linings, honestly, has been the, 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 the possibilities that have been enabled um, through this partnership. So, so Father, Father Robert, and indeed, uh, especially Irini, who's been um, really a, a, a fireball uh, you know, go get her driving us uh, forward on this series. Uh, thank you to you both. And thank you to you all there in Brussels uh, for the work that you do. Um, I would invite you today to support the Bolandists. You can follow the link on the website. Uh, you've heard so much about their work today and you've heard about some of the needs. Um, so just follow the link and, you know, a gift of any kind goes a long way. Um, a gift of a big kind certainly goes a long way. Uh, and you can, um, you can follow up uh, with the Bolandists on the website uh, if you just want to engage in dialogue with them and learn more about how you can support their work. I'd also invite you at the conclusion of this series to, invite, to support us in three different ways. Um, first, help get word out to your friends and parishes. Follow us on social media and share our materials. Uh, word of mouth continues to be the best way to be inviting others into engagement with the Catholic intellectual tradition. Become a financial supporter of our work today, um, at donating at www.lumenchristi.org slash donating, allowing us to continue to make programs like these available for free to viewers like you. And then finally, take our survey today. You'll enter a, a raffle to, to win a gift card to our favorite local independent bookstore. It helps us to know what we're doing right with our programming and where we can improve. Um, so thank you once more, Father Robert, Father Michael, and all of you, I hope you have a blessed and holy weekend. Take care and God bless. <laughs>